Welcome everyone to another episode of the Free Caviar Podcast. Uh, today we have Jake McPaul, the VP of Supply Chain at Smallhold. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for taking your time to be on the show today. Of course, you got it. Uh, so Jake, uh, you have a fascinating background because you used to be a freight broker at CH uh, Robinson and now yeah. you're dealing, you're a shipper essentially, you're dealing with brokers and trucking companies all day. So definitely have a lot of uh, interesting inputs and to, to see like how the logistics world really is. And uh, right before we recorded, you said that the freight broker is a punching bag and I, I wanted uh, to dive in. To, if you could explain why yeah. why why is a freight broker a punching bag? The freight broker essentially is a punching bag because they are responsible for solving any problems that might arise. So um, a truck breaks down, uh, a carrier is late for a pickup, a carrier no call, no shows, um, whatever you and I know from our brokerage days that are headaches. You know, as the shipper. You can always just call the broker and you have your customer rep and you just lay into your customer rep and you force them to get whatever you need done. Um, And it's on the broker in order to maintain the business relationship that you have to go out and get done what is needed. Um, You know, I think there's a million brokers out there, right? So service is key. If they're not going to service you to the expectations, you can just drop them and carry on and go to a new one and probably get similar rates. So no matter what happens, the, the broker's always getting beat down. Um, and then even like in the, in the, when the market's shifting, um, the broker's the one that's constantly trying to deal with, um, you know, at the market recently, right? The market's been insanely hot, probably falling off a little bit right now, but the brokers are, again, the truck, trucking companies, direct carriers are beating up the brokers time and time again on rates. So yeah. it's the customer beating up on one end and the actual carriers beating up the brokers on the other end. So it's constant. True. Yeah, definitely. As a shipper, why, why won't you just work directly with a trucking company? Um, again, like going back to that service piece, you know, there's a million different things that can happen with a shipment. Um, and I think we were, I was mentioning it earlier, like I have a extensive background in shipping produce. Yeah. Um, and a lot of those produce loads are expedited, need to make delivery, um, you know, working with big retailers, big retailers need the product to arrive on time so they can fulfill their stores and make sure their shelves are full. So anytime there's a breakdown, um, you know, you need to, or anything, you need to solve for it. And Working with a direct carrier, I think you're limited unless it's the huge carriers. Like if you work with like a Knight or a Swift or any of these huge, you know, JB Hunt, huge asset carriers, they can problem solve for you. They have assets everywhere. They can go into their portal, figure out where the trucks are, reroute things and problem solve. But if you're working with a guy with like a hundred trucks and he's using his assets to cover shipments going, you know, across the country, your flexibility is gone. Um, Whereas the broker can come in and decide, okay, carrier A is broken down. I'm going to utilize carrier B or C or however in their huge network to problem solve. Um, So I think that's kind of where the the brokerage is like a a necessary evil, if you will. Sure. I mean, it's it's interesting because a lot of people think either brokers are going to go away uh, because technology is going to replace them. And there's no need for brokers just because like I, I've, I've heard examples from like venture capitalists who, who don't really know logistics, never worked in logistics, but they just see the idea that, oh, there used to be like a stockbroker and now there's Robinhood. So the same thing's going to be in logistics and logistics is like very behind in terms of technology. So like certainly. Yeah. But like I, I have a feeling that like shippers don't want to let go of brokers. Right. I mean, yeah, I mean, I've always worked in food. Um, I've always shipped food. I've always shipped time sensitive things. I think, yeah, you could probably replace dry van loads that are low margin shipments that aren't high touch. You can probably definitely replace those. Um, but when you're talking about 
food shipments and even pharma shipments, you need to have a broker in there or just a human essentially servicing the, the shipment. Um, sure. So, you know, I, I do agree to a point that technology can remove at least part of the equation. Um, but, you know, those high service, high touch shipments, there, yeah. there's always going to need to be a human involved. Definitely. And I, I'm guessing mushrooms are pretty high value, right? Because uh, that's what you're shipping. Uh, I wouldn't say they're, they're high value. Depends. I mean, if you have a full truckload of like morels or Chantel, like really like rare mushrooms, yeah, yeah. it's going to be insane high value. But um, they are highly perishable, like highly okay. perishable. They, they can't be on the road very long. They're, they don't like being in boxes. So, you know, basically what you're trying to do is get from A to B ASAP. And honestly, what we're trying to solve for is reducing that A to B. So that's why okay. we're building farms cl cl like close to the consumer so that the consumer can have a higher quality mushroom that is fresher than, you know, your standard mushrooms that are shipping around the country now going long distances on the road for a while sometimes co-load it with other products that um, could even impact the mushroom. Sure. And uh, where are those farms right now located? Uh, so our first one is in Brooklyn. Uh, our second one is in Austin proper. So South Austin, the third one we built, which is our largest to date is in Buda, Texas, which is between San Antonio and Austin. And then our fourth is currently underway in Vernon, California. So like just, I think, uh, southwest of downtown LA. Okay. And so you got uh, this mushroom, these mushroom farms, like let's say about Brooklyn. Uh, where are you shipping these mushrooms? Like because you're, you're shipping them out of Brooklyn, right? So yeah, we're, so in Brooklyn, for example, we do a lot of restaurant drops. So direct to restaurants. Um, and then we also do like direct to Whole Foods. So we're going and we're doing DSD delivery in Whole Foods. Um, okay. And then we're actually in Brooklyn right now, we're limited. We <laughs> demand far out seeds what we can grow. Um, okay. So we're actually, we're eventually planning on a, another farm in the Northeast to meet our demand. Um, and then for example, in Austin, we're going in as far as Dallas. So going up to Safeway, we're going up to Misfits Market in Dallas, and then we're doing deliveries in San Antonio and deliveries in Austin, uh, Whole Foods, Central Market, uh, some retailers, and then also okay. small, like direct to restaurant deliveries and also working with distributors. Okay. And I know before our conversation, we were talking about like the complexities of dealing with uh, trucks in the Brooklyn area. And yeah. And so you're not sending 53 foot driving or 53 foot reefers to pick these loads up. You're sending in box trucks, straight trucks, right? Yeah. So it's 26 foot reefer trucks that are straight trucks. Okay. Um, I mean, I've, you can imagine any big city, but especially in the Northeast where the streets are old, the streets are tight, the streets are small. A lot of like, even like the building infrastructure is not at dock level. Um, so a lot of times you're dealing with like a truck blocking off the street while traffic's trying to get by with his door open while a forklift is coming and taking a pallet at a time. So yeah. it's a headache. You cannot, you can't send a 53. And that's like, honestly, where warp has come in, like 26 foot trucks are not easy to source. And I think we mentioned this before, you know, even at a brokerage, when you think about booking a truck, you're like always thinking 53 foot drive in or 53 foot reefer that 26 foot truck, you, it's not just easily available. Um, so that's where warp has come in, where we need 26 foot reefers. Uh, we need to be able to get into the city. We need to be able to get out of the city and you call warp and they're, they're there with the 26 footers. And um, honestly, it's honestly even easier to even deal with the 26 foot truck when you're going into grocery stores. Um, and hopefully in the future, we're using warp to co-load with other grocers and can handle that. They can handle the DSD deliveries going to restaurants or even grocery stores. Um, that's at least the future goals. Okay. 
I, I haven't been booking lows like for a while and nonetheless I haven't really booked any 26 foot reefer at lows. I'm wondering what are like the rates that you're paying uh like out of Brooklyn uh on a 26 foot reefer like so that like logistics might must take like a big chunk, right? Might must cost a lot. Yeah, I mean you don't you don't see a ton of savings like you would think with just the size of the equipment that you would see savings on fuel usage, but the availability. So the supply of the 26 foot truck is lower. So the demand is higher and you're going to end up paying probably a similar rate for a 53 foot. Um, okay. You know, I think it's like reverse logic. People are like, okay, smaller truck, smaller equipment, cheaper, cheaper cost. And it just doesn't work out that way. It's just because everyone wants 26 foot reefer probably in Brooklyn. Right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, you go to Brooklyn and they're just driving around everywhere. And then if you're in Brooklyn and you see a 53 foot reefer, you just like scratch your head. You're like, this dude is screwed <laughs> <laughs> driving through Brooklyn in this huge piece of equipment. Oh, for sure. Man, I totally, uh, totally agree with that. And what, what is the value of a 26 foot reefer? If you fill it up with mushrooms, like on average load value. Yeah. Low value of mushrooms. Uh, let me think. So I would say something like not a ton, probably like most it would be is like $30,000. So, okay. yeah, you're not, and again, like if you're shipping like super rare mushrooms that are foraged by hand, your value is going to go way through the roof and you're going to, that, that value is good. Like close over a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. What about truffles? I, uh, do you guys deal with any truffles or no? I do not. Um, I honestly think most truffles are like so white glove delivery that they're going to like large distributors like Daldor, for example, is probably, I have no idea. I'm just speaking on assumptions here, but I imagine truffles are, they're definitely shipped via air into the country. And then they're either going to like an importer who's handling them and just delivering them like high direct to the consumer. The value is insane. Like I can't even, I don't even know what the value of a pallet of truffles would be. It'd be hundreds of thousands. Yeah. yeah. I saw this documentary. It's an Italian documentary about truffles. Really good film. Uh, I forgot the title of it, but if, if you, I don't know if you're into mushrooms uh, or truffles, but it, it shows like in Italy how there's like these uh, older men that just go like they've been doing it for their whole lives. They yeah. go with their dogs and they go digging for truffles and people out there put poison in like the forest so that their dogs die. Cause the dogs are like almost essential to like the, the truffle finding. Yeah. And, dogs and pigs. Yeah. And it's like, there are like, there's people that poison dogs just so that they could, it's like it's gold for them the truffles out there so uh i I think it's that that was a fascinating movie i absolutely recommend it um if i had the title yeah they're they're definitely doing like air cargo for those um they're not growing and then like yeah you can't i don't think you can grow much or grow truffles you i think there's actually there's a danish company or like danish scientists figured it out um but it's like an insane process and I, I don't even think it's scalable. Um, but then again, Plus, if the value of a truffles, hundreds of thousands of dollars, I'm sure you can find some investment to scale it. Yeah. I mean, that's why they're so expensive because they're so hard to find. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't even think they taste that, go- that great. I think if people are just, it's like the, I'm shaving this expensive thing onto my food type thing. Yeah. Uh, uh, to be honest, I didn't like truffles until I saw this movie and I saw the whole process of like how how difficult it is to find a truffle. And for some reason, it started tasting better after that movie. I'm not going to lie. Like, I didn't like truffles until I watched that movie. And now, Fair enough. Yeah, Fair now enough. I'm like, damn, these truffles are like, it took so long to find this truffle. And now I'm like eating it. <laughs> and I'm like, this is, it does taste better. I'm not going to lie. Um, but, but to return to, to the freight broker, uh, like scene, like, like you, you told me earlier that you get bombarded with freight brokers spamming you like LinkedIn messages. Yeah. Well, what do you like, 
Is there any way for a freight broker to stick out? Uh, like, do you ever reply to these freight brokers? And uh, I mean, tell me as much as you can about all this freight broker spamming you stuff. Oh, uh, yeah. Like, so my favorite freight broker spam is the, are the guys who are literally guessing your email address. <laughs> they're going out, they're, if they find you on LinkedIn and then they, they guess your email address and they successfully get through to you. And that's like, I, I appreciate the hustle. Um, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> like it's constant LinkedIn, they're inboxing you, they're connecting with you. And like, as, I guess for me as a shipper who used to be a freight broker, like I totally understand it. I luckily was on like the carrier operation side. I wasn't on like the sales side of things, but um uh, to me, the best way to connect with the broker is just meeting somebody at like a conference or, you know, even I used to even have people show up at facilities and just be like, hey, here's my card. Let me work with you. Let me haul some freight and prove it to you that I can execute on the business. That stuff's a little crazy as well. Um, I've gone to conferences as a shipper. I've met a lot of great brokers there. Um, that to me is usually the best. Uh, honestly, like the email bombardment and the LinkedIn bombardment gets frustrating. Um, especially if you're just like constantly like just deleting out emails or yeah. having to go and read irrelevant messages. It's hard. Like I, we've mentioned this earlier. There's like a, there's a million of them. There's yeah. so many brokers of all different sizes. So I get what they're trying to do. Um, it's just, yeah, it's, just, it's kind of hilarious. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, with the whole email thing, it's funny because I worked with this customer sales rep and he was trying to teach me some tips. This is like a, it was actually like last summer, I was like thinking of opening a freight brokerage. And that's literally the trick he told me. He's like, all right, Paul, so you go on these LinkedIn pages and then like you figure out what their domain is and then you figure yep. out what how their email will look like. <laughs> that was his trick. Yep. And he used to work I mean, in command. It's... With Paul Loeb and Paul Loeb, like, uh, ran American bag haulers or worked at American. So it's like these are tricks from like you know high up, <laughs> taking from high up for sure. First out, last name at first initial last name at oh. or just like first name at. Um, yeah, and it's funny because at my current company, Small Hold, there's a there's another Jake that was there before me, and his emails Jake at and he's constantly like hey I get all these emails that I think are supposed to go to you they're like freight brokers what should I do with them I'm just like delete them please <laughs> poor guy <laughs> have you ever responded to like a uh, like an email uh from a freight broker that wanted to work with you yeah sometimes I mean I, I actually do it every now and then um especially like if I, it's uh, just like five different emails i'm just like hey man i i appreciate it but you know we're we're currently one not shipping that much freight so this is not a huge account and two we're we're good we have a we have a, a current broker that we're using yeah sure i know there's just like in the last few years there's been an influx of freight brokerages left and right uh and what i've been hearing is that everyone gets like all these emails and spams and I get, I get messages all the time where people are like, Oh, Paul, how do I get a shipper? How do I do this? And like, I'm like, dude, like just best of luck. Uh, it's, it's, it's not easy. And people think it's easy. Yeah. I mean, I honestly have used most of like what I've used in my careers post being a broker is just personal relationships. Um, you know, a guy you worked with, uh, like a customer rep you worked with that you thought was good left, went to a different company and he's working there now and you you know have a personal relationship with them you know you can talk to that person you know you can call their cell phone and you don't really have to establish a new relationship i for one am lucky because i've come from the brokerage world but um honestly there's there's a lot of people that are probably getting those emails and are probably like wow i actually do need help and i mean i'm sure they they land a lot of customers from bombarding people I, they have to um, sure. because there's a ton of people who have no idea what they're doing with freight. Okay. That, and that, that does true. go back to what the broker is good at, right? So the broker is the, the solutions expert, right? Yeah. yeah they definitely could 
you know, some brokers could definitely make your life a lot easier or they can make it a pain in the ass if they don't do their job properly. But that, that gets yeah. to actually my next question is like, like, what does a broker do well? Like, like what are like, like if you, have you ever, first of all, put a broker into like, do not use, like you're never going to work with this broker again. And so, yeah, definitely. Is, okay. So what are like the, the things that a broker should do like each time to, to make sure that they keep your business? I mean, for me, the one, the, the main thing I think everyone knows is just like communication over communicate. Um, there's nothing worse than sending an email out looking for an update and the update comes back that there's something wrong. That is like, to me, cross off the list, never use again. Um, especially like if you've made it very clear that the shipment like needs to be on time, highly, highly important, need white glove service, and then something goes wrong and it's not communicated. Um, but I mean, honestly, like the broker, I, I, I firmly believe the broker is essential, right? Like I, here's an example that I think is really, really good. I went to the last company I was at. Um, I came in as director of logistics and they were already operating. They already had freight moving in. And when I came in and I evaluated the freight situation, I was like, who set this up? Who's doing this? And honestly, they responded to an email and the broker legitimately took care of everything. Like, this is how you ship this produce. This is how you ship this produce. This is how you build loads. The, these commodities can ship together. And they, the broker handled it from A to B, set everything up for them. And these were you know, young people working at a startup, just never shipped freight before and were getting it done just by the broker. So. Um, but back to like the original question, I mean, honestly, lack of communication and not going the extra mile to make sure that what you said you're going to do is done is like cross off the list. If you don't do it. Yeah. I mean, right. Especially with so many people reaching out to you for your business. It's like, they have to be willing to go the extra mile. Yeah. I mean, honestly, like rate, rates are like super important right you can't just overspend on freight you can't just be it's not an open checkbook you have to be within like the navigational beacon of what the market is but i for one in a lot of situations am willing to pay for better service um i'd much rather be able to go to sleep at night for and not think about like what's going on with my shipments and I'd pay that extra 100, 200 dollars per shipment to ensure that the yeah. broker I'm using is 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 good. Yeah, especially with perishable <laughs> items like food with like mushrooms. Yeah, like I've never really had the luxury of shipping dry freight. Um, yeah. I don't know how I was cursed with this, but <laughs> this has been food has been <laughs> it for me since since day one. So I, I don't really know. Okay, so we're we're. Uh... Or would you rather be a broker or a shipper? Shipper, for sure. It's, okay. it's way easier. You're calling the <laughs> shots. <laughs> okay, that's good to know. So that's honestly why I left. That's why yeah. I left brokerage. I went to like, I was like, I don't want to be in the brokerage world. Where, what am I going to do? And I went to the shipper side and I was like, okay. this is great. This is, this is such a relief. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brokerage is stressful. <laughs> I burnt out a few times. That's why I left. I mean, I'm I'm so happy not to be covering freight anymore. And I'm yeah, making, it's insane. Yeah, life's people a lot better. <laughs> yeah, people uh, don't people don't get it. Like the, especially in like produce, where like the end of the week at like a produce brokerage or a produce shop who's like covering like produce loads, when you know like all right, I only have X amount of time to get this booked because the market's basically going to just completely shut off. There's going to be no trucks to book on like a Saturday. Shippers yeah. don't ship on a Sunday. I need to get this truck in there on a Saturday. Like that end of week sprint is the most stressful thing ever. So stressful. And like, yeah. I think produce shippers are always like really cheap on rates just because they're fighting with their margin. 
I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. That's my, that's my, uh, uh, past experience. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's not easy being a broker dealing with all, with all the, like, they're the, they're the punching bag, just like you said at the beginning, it yeah. perfectly defines it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, Jake, uh, thanks for your time. If there's anything else you want to tell us, uh, about yourself or like your experience, uh, I guess you could, you could tell us now, if not, I'll wrap it up. Um, go to, go to Whole Foods in the mid Atlantic and in New York city and in the Southwest and get, uh, small hold mushrooms. Perfect. Awesome. I'll put some logos out there on your website. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mushrooms but, uh, are healthy and delicious. <laughs> I, I appreciate your time, Jake. And I, I would love to continue the conversation. Hopefully maybe in a few months, we could go to like part two where you give us maybe some, some more tips for, for the freight brokers out there and tell us more about your mushrooms. All right, cool. Talk then. Thanks, Jake. Yeah.